Welcome to Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, offering biblical guidelines, principles of the kingdom of heaven that will help you stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven and reap the benefits that accompany you as a citizen of the kingdom. The best the king has to offer. Today's topic is the unity of believers in union with Christ. Psalm chapter 133 speaks concerning the beauty of the unity of brethren. It reads, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. In this psalm of brotherly unity, the first verse and the last line of the third verse frame a picture of the main theme of this psalm. It highlights the blessed state of true believers who live together in peace and unity. I'll read the two together. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Notice also that there are two complementary similes in verses 2 and 3. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. And it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. The oil of Aaron's anointing saturated all the hair of his beard and ran down on his priestly robes, signifying his total consecration to holy service. Similarly, brotherly unity sanctifies God's people. Mount Hermon was the site of unusually heavy dew, a great blessing in an arid country. A dew as profuse as that of Mount Hermon would make Mount Zion richly fruitful. Watch this. So would brotherly unity make Israel richly fruitful. So the two similes in Psalm 133 are well chosen. God's blessings flowed to Israel through the priestly ministrations at the sanctuary, epitomizing God's redemptive mercies, and through heaven's dew, that sustained life in the fields, epitomizing God's providential mercies in the creation order. And of course, life forevermore is symbolic of the great covenant blessing. We can never overinflate persuading people to live together in unity. Not only is it good for all people, for our honor and conduct, our comfort as well. Unity brings constant delight to life. The pleasantness of unity is likened to the holy anointing oil. This is the fruit of the Spirit, the proof of our union with Christ, which beautifies his gospel. It is profitable as well as pleasing. It brings blessings numerous as the drops of dew from heaven. It cools the scorching heat of men's passions as dew cools the air and refreshes the earth. It moistens the heart and makes it fit to receive the good seed of the word of God and to make it grow and produce fruit. So in Psalm 133, we clearly see the proof of the excellence of brotherly love because where brotherly love is, God commands the blessing. Where brethren dwell together in unity, the Lord commands the blessing. Wherever brotherly love and unity dwell, there. God commands the blessing. Believers that live in love and peace shall have the God of love and peace with them now. Jehovah Shammah, which means God is there. So that we may get a deeper revelation of the word unity, let's define it from the Hebrew and Greek languages. Yalkad is the Hebrew equivalent of our English word unity. It is a primary root word which means to be or become one, to join, unite, be alike, at all once, and together. Now, henates is the Greek equivalent of our English word unity. It means oneness, unanimity, unity. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, is a beautiful expression of the believer's union with Christ. Pay close attention to the imagery 
used in this context as Jesus symbolizes himself as the true vine. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. The union of the human and divine natures, and the fullness of the Spirit that is in Jesus, resemble the root of the vine made fruitful by the moisture from a rich soil. Believers are branches of this vine. The root is unseen, and our life is hid with Christ. The root bears the tree and diffuses sap into it. Likewise, in Christ are all supports, supplies, and nutrients needed to produce healthy believers, healthy Christians. Although there are many branches of the vine, yet every nutrient needed to produce branches is in the root. All are but one vine. And so all true believers, though we are distant from one another geographically, we all meet in Christ. Believers, like the branches of the vine, are weak and unable to stand in their own strength. They must be borne up. Our Heavenly Father is the vine dresser. There's never been any farmer so wise and watchful concerning his vineyard as God is about his church. Therefore, the church must prosper. Believers must be fruitful. From a vine, we look for grapes, and from a Christian, we look for Christ's likeness, a lifestyle that honors God and produces good works. This is bearing fruit. The unfruitful are taken away, and even fruitful branches need pruning that they may bear even more fruit. The word of Christ is spoken to all believers, and there is a cleansing virtue in that word to work in grace and to work out corruption. And the more fruit we bring forth, the more we abound in what is good, and the more our Lord is glorified. In order to obtain fruitfulness, we must abide in union with Christ by faith. As branches on the true vine, we must discipline ourselves constantly to remain dependent upon Christ, having communion with him. Those who do not abide in Christ, though they may flourish for a while, in outward appearance and profession, eventually come to nothing. And as we know, the fire is the fittest place for withered branches that are good for nothing else. But as true believers, we seek to live more simply on the fullness of Christ in union with him and to grow more fruitful in every good work and work so that our joy in him and in his salvation is always full. And so we will indeed be his disciples. Our union with Christ if it be true, will manifest in oneness. Oneness of mind, oneness of spirit, oneness in suffering, oneness in worship, and oneness in ministry. As believers, our exhortation is to unify, and that means showing consideration for others and making allowance for their shortcomings. These attitudes are the essence of love. They bring unity and peace. God has placed all believers together as one body, the church, and we must work to preserve that unity in union, the state of being united with Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The word mind in that verse is the Greek word nous. It means the intellect, divine mind. We have the divine mind, the divine intellect of God. It also means a divine mind in thought, feeling, or will, in meaning and understanding. We have the mind of Christ. Christ is the wisdom of God. 
the genius of God and the intelligence of God. Therefore, since born again believers have the mind of Christ, like I said earlier, our mind must be Christ or Christ-like. To be more specific, our lifestyle in union with Christ also manifests our oneness with him in spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Let's go even further. Jesus himself testified of the believer's union with God and with him in his prayer to God for all believers. We'll find that in John chapter 17, verses 21 through 23. Let's read that. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. What a beautiful discourse. The Lord Jesus specifically prayed that all believers might be as one body, under one head, and endowed with life by one soul, by their union with Christ and the Father in him and through the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. We must endeavor by the power of the Holy Spirit to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, praying that all believers may be more and more united in one mind and one judgment. This is how we convince the world of the truth and excellence of our kingdom status as kings and priests unto God, and find sweet communion with God and his saints, our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Apostle Paul exhorts us to know Christ, our union with Christ doesn't dismiss our suffering with him for his name and the gospel's sake. Paul reminds us that though we are many, we are one bread and one body of Christ, for we all partake of the same bread. In Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, he reminds us that there is one body and one spirit, just as we were called in one hope of our calling. He reminds us that there is but one God and Father of us all and who is in us all. Let's take a look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 16, as Apostle Paul exhorts believers to know Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Wow. Knowing Christ Jesus not only consists of having knowledge of facts, but also knowledge gained through personal experience that in its surpassing greatness transforms the entire person. The life Paul discovered as a Christian was not merely preferable or a better alternative to his old lifestyle as a devout, zealous, religious Pharisee who hated Christians. <laughs> no, in contrast, Paul through his union with Christ as a believer, came to realize his former way of life was worthless and despicable. Paul expresses his understanding of being in union with Christ. His desire was to be found in him, 
union with Christ, not simply an experience in the past, but a present continuing relationship in righteousness is what led to his desire of a true relationship with Christ, not in accordance with the righteousness of the law, but by faith, which is the principal benefit of union with Christ. In verse 10, Paul said, that I may know him. This knowledge of Christ is not merely factual. It includes the personal experience of the power of his resurrection, of fellowship in his sufferings, and of being like him in his death. That's knowing God. Okay, that's knowing Christ. As believers, we already share positionally in Christ's death and resurrection. However, Paul speaks of the actual experience of Christ's resurrection power and of suffering with and for him, even to the point of death. The scripture says, if by any means. If by any means is not an indication of doubt or uncertainty on Paul's part, but of intense concern and involvement. The resurrection is the great personal anticipation of every true believer. In verses 12 through 14, Paul used imagery to point out that the Christian life is like a race of which we must enter and complete. He lets us know that he had not yet attained perfection in his union with Christ, but his goal is Christ's goal for him. And Christ supplies the resources for him to press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul assures us that he never lost all memory of his sinful past of persecuting Christians, but leaving it behind him as done with and settled. He said, look, Yeah, I remember when I persecuted Christians, but guess what? I'm in union with Christ now. I leave that stuff behind me now. That's done and settled with. All Paul wanted was the prize, that everlasting glory given to the faithful in the day of Christ's judgment. Paul's ultimate aspirations were not found in this life, but in heaven. Why? Because Christ is there. This is where Christian maturity comes into play in the life of the believer, those who have made reasonable progress in spiritual growth and progress. Spiritual maturity involves the union of the mind with Christ, or as I said earlier, our mind is Christ. This is the mind we have as born-again believers. This is our mind, our view. There are heights yet to be scaled, yes, so we dare not become complacent. And if anyone thinks otherwise, as the scripture says, God will clarify the matter for them. Now, our discourse concludes with verse 16 saying, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, Let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. We must put into practice the truth we have already comprehended, what we do know and understand, as we are responsible for the truth we currently possess. Our unity and union with Christ began with our new birth. And as we continue to press toward the prize of God's high calling, wherewith he has called us in Christ Jesus, we are being perfected to be conformed to his likeness. Our union with Christ produces Christ-likeness. His life lived through us here on earth. Now, let's support that statement with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Listen, the renewed man acts upon new principles, by new rules, with new ends, and in new company. The believer is created again. His old heart is not merely set right, but a new heart is given. He is now the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus for good works. Though the same as any man, he is changed in his character and conduct, more than an outward reformation. The man who formerly saw no beauty in Christ Jesus, that he should desire him, now loves him above all things. The heart of the unregenerate is filled with enmity against God, yet there can be reconciliation. God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. 
You see, by the inspiration of God, the scriptures were written, which are the word of reconciliation, showing that peace has been made for us by Jesus' finished work on the cross and how we may be saved therein. Through Jesus' great sacrifice, one time for all people forever, God beseeches sinners to lay aside their enmity and accept the salvation he offers. Christ knew no sin. Watch this. He was made sin. Not a sinner, but sin. A sin offering. A sacrifice for sin. The end and design of all this was that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is, justified freely by the grace of God through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Let's conclude with 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, to solidify our unity in union with Christ. It reads, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves? that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Now that's real union with Christ. If you would like to refer this episode to others, click on share and subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay up to date when new episodes drop. Thanks for joining me. I'm glad you did. I hope you join me next time for Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, where we stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven. <laughs>